Well, welcome to the fourth in a series of uh, webinars on cutting edge legal, legal topics uh, uh, put on by Momkis McCluskey. Uh, I'm Bob Bruce with the firm. And uh, uh, the topic for today is managing risk related to the problem employee. Uh, we think you'll find it informative and, and enjoyable. Uh, look forward to uh, spending some time with all of you. Uh, I'm pleased to work today with uh, Lauren Parks, who is an associate in our firm and works quite a bit in the area of employment law and employment litigation. And we'll have a number of informative uh, tidbits to add as we work through our uh, presentation today. So for all of you out there who are, in, who are working with your own businesses, I, I think it goes without saying that attracting and retaining the right employees uh, is often cited by business leaders, business leaders as their greatest challenge. So getting the right people doing the right things is crucial to your business and avoiding risk from the problem employee in that process is, is obviously also crucial. There, oftentimes folks will review, uh, refer to the 80-20 rule that they'll end up spending 80% of their time on problem employees and 20% of the time, uh, time working with uh, high performing individuals and and obviously for the success of your business you want to try to turn that around so what we're about here today is trying to just to educate you as to the bigger problems the constant challenge and delicate balance uh, that you all have in dealing with problem problem employees versus high level high level performers uh, I think it I think it makes absolute sense that it would add only insult to injury that in trying to transition uh, your workforce from the folks that are not necessarily getting it done and producing results if as you transition to those that can get the job done you nevertheless produce liability by uh, utilizing strategies that don't uh, uh, that don't uh, get the, get the job done from not only a performance standpoint but also from a legal risk standpoint so what we're going to be about today is pr trying to give you practical solutions to moving problem employees on without unnecessarily creating uh, legal risk. It, it makes all the sense in the world that you want to simply move to uh, better performing employees. And to, to make those decisions and make them in a quick and, and uh, precise fashion is, is fantastic. However, there are many problems that can arise from a legal risk standpoint, and just a few examples. Uh, company fired an employee and, and her husband after she testified uh, at an employment hearing for another worker. The jury then awarded the employee and her husband four million plus dollars. Uh, it's obviously not what you want to hear as you're running your business that as you work toward uh, transitioning your your team to a more productive team that you have someone uh, that you needed to move on and yet the, the liability is in excess of four million dollars. Next, you could have, uh, there was the story of a 49-year-old worker who sued his employer for falsely accusing him of altering documents and then firing him. He argued the real reason was age discrimination, a common tactic by uh, problem employees to utilize age discrimination as a theory. The jury then awarded the plaintiff $5 million. What's unfortunate about these kinds of cases is that you can see that uh, it's sometimes it's just the argument and the way the facts can be pitched. It isn't necessarily the true age discrimination took place, but nevertheless, a mishandling of the situation allowed for it to evolve into a $5 million verdict and all of the legal fees associated with it. Uh, last example, an employer fired a gay employee for being incompetent. The employee sued, claiming that he was a victim of a hostile work environment and that the real reason for the termination was that he was uh, gay. Jury awarded the employee 11 million dollars plus. So I, I think the point is is that there are many situations these days that can, uh, if, if they're mishandled, can lead to litigation and can lead to real liability. This isn't just a few hundred dollars here or a few hundred dollars there. The kinds of cases that end up going to trial can uh, create liability that is far beyond anything that we would have imagined uh, many years ago. So the point is, is that the, 
the, the risk of litigation is, is real and significant. However, I think it's important to, to point out that the, the cost of keeping a non-performing employee, it can be just as real and just as significant to, to your business. It's, it's absolutely important that a strategy is developed to work through problem employee situations so that you get the best workforce, best team in place without, uh, without the problem of creating uh, insult injury, as I mentioned before, and creating liability in terms of the strategy that you develop. Many might offer that the simple answer to this situation is the employment at will doctrine, that employees are hired at will and they can be terminated for any reason or no reason. Uh, Lauren is going to cover the evolution of that employment at will doctrine and how it isn't the nirvana for solutions that it once may have been or certainly it is not today. Hello, I'm Lauren Parks. I'm an associate with Momkis McCluskey in the Commercial Litigation Division. And as Bob mentioned, I do focus on employment law and employment litigation. Um, Bob already mentioned or touched on the employment at will doctrine. And historically, uh, this doctrine meant that an employer could terminate the employee for any reason or no reason whatsoever. And it had an advantage for the employee as well because it meant the employee could leave his or her employment for any reason whatsoever. It was kind of a defense to any kind of involuntary servitude uh, that might have been in effect historically. However, uh, both statutes and case law have substantially eroded this doctrine so that in many cases, uh, the termination of the employee could look suspect and potentially uh, lead to litigation and or uh, a penalty and damages. The employment at will doctrine, um, as I stated, means that you could terminate an employee for any reason or no reason at all, but case law and statutes have substantially eroded this doctrine. Uh, there are now many exceptions to the employment at will doctrine, including written contracts. So especially with high-level employees, you may enter into a written contract with the employee, um, guaranteeing them perhaps a one-year term of employment. And often in those contracts, it states something along the lines of the employee shall not be terminated except for, quote, cause. So in instances like that, uh, if you terminate the employee, it's no longer employment at will. You do have to go through a step-by-step -step analysis to see if you're entitled to terminate the employee. Um, there's also implied contracts that can come in the form of perhaps your written handbooks and your policies may state something that could lead an employee to reasonably believe that he or she is guaranteed employment as long as certain parameters or criteria are, are met or for a certain term. Um, also, you may or someone on your staff may make an oral assurance to the employee saying, as long as your sales are X dollars a year or X dollars a quarter, we guarantee you employment. Once you've made a statement like that, if it's reasonable for the employee to rely upon it, you're now in a situation where you can't necessarily terminate the employee for any reason whatsoever. There are also various illegal discrimination categories. Uh, so if the employee claims that he or she fits within one of these categories and that he or she was actually terminated because of their status, um, rather than for any other reason, they could state a potential cause of action for illegal discrimination. Um, this is an ever-growing list of categories, so this is not an exclusive list, but they include reasons of race or color. Um, and this, is, this, uh, this must be expanded slightly. It's not necessarily the, what you would think of as minority race, uh, such as black or Latino. If you have a workplace that is substantially, let's say, African-American and you terminate a white employee, the white employee could claim that he or she was terminated due to his or her race or color. Um, there's also religion as a protected status, sex as a protected status, age as a protected status, disability and handicap, uh, and that's a more expansive category than it seems at first glance. You could have an employee who has asthma and that could be considered a disability or a handicap. And if the employee comes to you and says, I really need a reasonable accommodation to accommodate my asthma, and you refuse the accommodation and then later terminate him, that employee could potentially have a cause of action against you. Um, there's also protected categories for veteran status, sexual orientation, homelessness, 
The list is ever growing, so there will be more to this list as well. There's also an exception to the Employment at Will Doctrine for public policy. Um, this can include whistleblowers, so an employee who makes a complaint to a governmental entity, uh, perhaps about your business, claiming that maybe you violated OSHA. Um, a very popular, or I, would, I don't want to say popular, but common cause of action arises from worker compensation claims. Maybe your employee was injured on the job and has made a worker's compensation claim or will be making a worker's compensation soon, and you terminate that employee. That employee can claim that he or she was terminated for exercising his rights under the workers' compensation statute, and that is a cause of action um, that they can use. Um, as you can see, there are a ever-growing number of uh, exceptions to the Employment at Will Doctrine, and this has essentially swallowed up the Employment at Will rule. Um, and when you have a potential wrongful, uh, wrongful termination claim, this can create a significant litigation risk. Um, and Bob is going to talk to you about what you can do to manage your risk and avoid litigation. So hopefully Laura hasn't completely intimidated you from managing your business and wanting to simply move to another country uh, because it can get uh, a, a little bit difficult to deal with at times. The point is to take a step back and develop a strategy for managing the risk related to your problem employees. I'm going to touch on a number of different kind of unrelated legal considerations uh, in relation to uh, the managing of the risk related to uh, problem employees. The first thing is to be cognizant of the nature of a potential claim related to the problem employee that you have that you are uh, trying to work through a strategy or work through uh, a, a departure of that employee. For example, if you have an employee who is in the age protected category, age 40 and over, or certainly age 50 or over age 50 or 60, and you want to begin to develop a strategy, let that employee go, you have to be cognizant of the fact that they may bring an age claim. And in that regard, it can oftentimes be awkward if you engage in a conversation with that employee where you bring up the word retire. I'll often call that in counseling clients that you've brought up the R word because of the innuendo that surrounds that word related to age, it can almost be used as evidence that you're discriminating uh, against the employee or taking age into account when making an employment related decision related to that employee. Disability claims with the advent of the Americans with Disability Act uh, and uh, other state law uh, handicap and disability oriented uh, protections uh, can be particularly difficult to deal with because many, many employees who once had no protections under the law have some sort of a problem that they can allege uh, put them in a protected category and mean that if you're taking an adverse employment action against that employee, it's prompted by their status of a particular disability. And any different kind of malady can, can oftentimes fall into that category. Uh, asthma, knee surgery, uh, migraine headaches, uh, issues that come up uh, in concert with the Family and Medical Leave Act, taking leave, taking time off, other sicknesses, problems, can put someone in the category of being disabled and therefore, unfortunately, in the, posi in, in the position to potentially, potentially bring a claim. So in terms of developing your strategy related to, the, to employees who fall in those categories, it's really important to be cognizant of that potential risk. Another aspect of uh, being cognizant of the potential risk is where you're letting a number of employees go, you want to be cognizant of the bigger picture. So if it just so happens that you're going to eliminate a particular department and that department is all male or that department is all female or that they are all a member of a particular, uh, uh, particular religion, you just have to be cognizant of what the big picture looks like when you lay out the plan for reorganizing or right-sizing or restructure, restructuring your company. The next legal consideration uh, that kind of comes up is uh, the, the notion of document, document, document. The reason why I, I describe that as a legal consideration is because the documents 
that are used in a wrongful termination case, in a, in a discrimination case at trial through the course of an investigatory process are often the ones that are being developed in terms of just managing the particular employee. The challenge there is that uh, HR professionals, lawyers alike will tell you you need to document, and you do need to document, but you need to document the right stuff because if you're documenting the wrong things or you're providing too much detail, the, the, the documents that you've created can be just as much a sword for the terminated employee in, in litigation as they can be a defense or, uh, or a, a matter of, of strategy uh, or protection for the employer. So that's really important to be cognizant of documenting the right stuff, not just documenting uh, anything as you, put, as you put your plan together. It's really important to implore, uh, explore interactive solutions with employees, and that's particularly important in, disability, in the context of potential disability claims. What I mean by an interactive solution is, what you want to do is you want to have a conversation with an employee that's having a performance problem and try to see where they're coming from, what they want to do. Maybe they want to move on. Maybe they, maybe they don't feel they can perform in the position they're in. Maybe they need some sort of reasonable accommodation, which is specifically identified in the case law under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Uh, maybe they need some sort of reasonable accommodation in order to get the job done. So it's very important to engage in interactive solutions with employees who have potential problems so that their admissions can be a defense to a potential claim and, and also maybe the solutions that they come up with in, in dialogue with you can put them in a position to perform better and maybe you uh, will be in a position where you do not even have to uh, transition the employee out of your organization. Next consideration. It's important to understand in all of these uh, situations I think that the business objectives have to mandate the final decisions. Uh, no matter the size of your company, no matter the nature of a particular problem that you're dealing with with an individual employee, it is really important that overall business objectives uh, are, the, are the considerations that drive the decisions. It will provide a, a more logical and cohesive approach to what you're doing from a business standpoint, but will also provide a more logical and cohesive approach to the defense of any claim that anyone would bring because that those business considerations are the appropriate con considerations for an employer to have versus other unlawful uh, considerations, objectives, and factors. So it's really important to let those business objectives uh, take precedence. Next thought, uh, consider a win-win approach. It's oftentimes very, very difficult to look a problem employee in the face and say, you're performing poorly, we don't want you around here anymore. You're performing poorly, we are going to reduce your pay. You're performing poorly, uh, we want to transition you into a new position. It can be a better sell, it can be an easier approach sometimes if you're able to construct a strategy where there's going to be a layoff, there's going to be a job elimination, there's going to be a restructuring, a reorganization. Any of those kinds of plans that you put in place can oftentimes put you in a place to communicate to an employee that this is not, no longer the place for them because you're going to be handling things differently in the future. You're going to be restructuring, right-sizing, reorganizing your business. So keep that kind of a win-win approach in mind when developing a strategy for dealing with an employee who's not getting it done, especially in an organization that you can see could be reorganized in order to make things flow more smoothly, operate more smoothly. Last point. All of these considerations can oftentimes dovetail in with a separation agreement. Separation agreements are important, but they must always include a release. So the, the nature of a, of a, a properly drafted and, and memorialized separation agreement will include a release that will 100% protect the company. So all these considerations, all these factors, all these concerns that we're identifying you for you can be 100% covered, 100% addressed through a separation agreement where the employee receives some consideration, some separation pay, and in return they, they sign a release saying the company is no longer on the hook for the way I was treated or anything related to my, anything related to my separation. I would say that the most important way to put yourself in a position to uh, 
to avoid legal risk related to the problem employees to truly embrace the notion of best HR practices. So what you want to start with, start from scratch. Work with your HR professional, work with your entire, entire uh, support team at your company to develop uh, an approach, a culture that will allow employees to see hey, this is the way things are going to operate here. Employees are going to perform uh, putting their best foot forward. And if not, uh, they're going to move on, but they're going to be treated fairly in the process. So in that regard, what you want to do is you want to review your employee handbooks, your contracts, your policies, uh, have them uh, be the best that they can possibly be. Uh, they follow the, the, the most uh, modern and up-to-date uh, policies and procedures, uh, recommendations that, that you can possibly have in place and they will create the kind of culture that you want for your organization. When you utilize progressive discipline policies that you have developed, make sure you follow them. Obviously, if you have a culture of putting those in place and people can see them, it's very, very important from a best HR practices standpoint that they're actually followed. Another, another important consideration is that an individual employee's file, uh, it's important that the file is kept properly, is completely compliant with all uh, legal, uh, legal requirements, Department of Labor requirements, I-9 requirements, et cetera, et cetera. If you have your house in order there, it will send the message that you've done things the right way and protect you from potential legal risk and substantiate the reasons uh, why you've ultimately determined that you needed to uh, separate, terminate, uh, reduce an, an employee's responsibilities or positions. Another uh, important consideration in terms of best HR practices is making sure that comparable problems with separate employees are being treated in, in a like or similar fashion. So that if you have employees, you know, male and female, the male employees are treated the same in terms of disciplinary problems as the female employees. If you have uh, employees that uh, are disabled, they're treated the same as employees who are non-disabled. Uh, all of your HR practices should be scrutinized to ensure that like problems are treated uh, similarly and do not create a potential for a uh, discrimination claim. The bottom line for all of this is that if you mishandle these kinds of situations, you can end up trying to win litigation rather than having strategized to deal with a problem employee in a practical business level. Litigation can be a huge distraction and an enormous expense. And Warren's going to talk a little bit more about that now. So as Bob mentioned, I'm going to give a quick overview of the litigation process and particularly in employment cases. Um, in employment discrimination or retaliatory discharge cases, uh, they can be particularly long and costly. And one of the reasons for this is that depending on what kind of claim is made, the former employee may have to first bring a claim before a governmental agency. And that will cause for hearings um, and a review process. And after you go through the internal uh, review procedure, you may then find yourself back in court. The employee will be given the right to then file a lawsuit. So you'll be going through a costly preliminary stage that in most cases you don't have to go through. So once the employee does file a case in court, um, unfortunately in employment discrimination cases, you can very rarely knock them out on an initial motion to dismiss. Uh, this is kind of an initial motion that sometimes can be brought to eliminate the case before it goes through the costly discovery phase. However, for various reasons, these usually don't work in the employment discrimination or retaliatory discharge process. Instead, you have to answer the complaint typically, and then you will go on to written discovery, which is an exchange of written answers and documents between the parties to various questions that each other pose. And then you move on to oral discovery, which is depositions, and this can be very costly, not only in terms of attorneys and attorney's fees, but also to you and your staff. Because for every deposition, you're going to need to pull out potentially one of your current employees who is maybe a decision maker or a witness to the termination or the termination decision. And he or she is going to have to prep for the deposition and give the deposition, which can go on for several hours. So it's very disruptive to your workplace. Um, Sometimes at that stage, you can move forward with what is called a dispositive motion. 
uh, if the facts lay very strongly on your side, potentially the case can be ended at that stage. But if not, you do move on to trial typically, um, unless you can settle the matter. And trials often involve juries and they can be very expensive. And then after the trial, depending on the verdict, either side has the right to appeal. So that can add uh, an additional amount of time. Um, typically it takes at least a year to get to trial. And then if someone does appeal, that usually adds at least another year. So as you can see, if an employment discrimination or retaliatory discharge case is filed, it can be extremely costly and disruptive, not only in terms of your attorney's fees and attorney's costs, but also just to your workplace and your employees who are trying to get on with doing their day-to-day -day business, but they have all these distractions in the form of the lawsuit. Um, Bob's going to wrap up for us and give you some practical tips and, a, and conclusions regarding this area. So the first thing that I would, I would mention to all of you as you, as you act uh, in, in this area and as you lead your organizations is create the best culture you can and embrace the best HR practices that fit your business. If you em truly embrace that, that approach, uh, number one, it will allow you to protect yourself against risks related to the problem employee, but the, the absolute necessary byproduct of that will be that you'll attract the best employees to your business, you'll retain the best employees in your business, they'll perform well, and hopefully the need for these kinds of considerations will be, uh, if not eliminated, greatly, greatly diminished. Secondly, focus on making your business successful from a financial perspective. Just hearkening back to some of the considerations that we mentioned earlier, if your business is, is uh, successful from a financial perspective, if you take sound, logical approaches to problems that you encounter, it'll put, put you in a position to defend claims, it'll put your best foot forward, and obviously to the extent that your business succeeds from a financial perspective, it will make dealing with these problems uh, less, uh, less uh, uh, difficult, it will make it uh, create a situation for you where you'll be able to uh, you'll be able to deal with them for a little bit longer period. You'll give yourself a little bit of leeway to deal with problems over a longer period of time. So focus on uh, making your business successful from a financial perspective. Perhaps the most practical, uh, most important practical tip I can give you all is trust uh, your advisors. Uh, the, the trusted advisors that you have that you're working with and running your business, your HR professionals, uh, your CFO, your outside accountants, your lawyers. Trust them as you work through strategizing problems uh, with particular employees because it's oftentimes very easy to get emotional about these kinds of issues, feel like you've been taken advantage, and maybe kind of jump off a cliff a little bit and say there's no way we're going to deal with this anymore. Someone who has put themselves in a position to be terminated by, your, by an organization can oftentimes become persona non grata very, very quickly. And when it, things reach an emotional high-pitched level like that, the strategies that are developed are oftentimes not the best thought out and, and oftentimes can create more of a problem than, than a solution. So really encourage you to, to trust uh, your advisors as you work through dealing with these problems, dealing with these kinds of problems all the way through, all the way through to the end. So with that, I would simply conclude by, by mentioning uh, create, create a competitive advantage for your organization by employing the best people uh, with the least risk. Uh, that's the way you can manage your way through uh, problems and potential legal risk with, with problem employees. And uh, if you have any uh, questions, like I said, uh, please shoot them through, but we appreciate, we appreciate you being here today.